So guys, before we go into our next talk, I want to introduce you to our next speakers. It's the amazing cone denim. So the cone denim are one of the, actually they are the original denim mill. So when Levi's and everyone else first started making denim, they went to Cone Denim first. So they're the first OG denim mill. And we're actually being sponsored by Cone as well. So some amazing fabrics we've got upstairs are also sponsored by Cone. So they're, they're going to be with us as well. And they're going to be seeing your final protos and your garments in the next few weeks. We've got, uh, we got like Prep, the head of uh, design and development. And also, we've also got Catalin as well, who takes care of, like, of, of like, sustainability. And also, but also it's also innovation. They've both given a talk about how denim is being made. I thought it was quite, quite interesting to see it from their like perspective. Pre-recorded talk, it's about 20 minutes long. Watch it, it's, it's, it's amazing. And Fred and Catalina are, are, are gonna join us right at the end. So please have your questions ready. <laughs> Did you know in 1891, the Cone brothers, Moses and Caesar, established the Cone Export and Commission Company in New York City. Five years later, in 1896, they opened the first denim mill in North Carolina and called it Proximity Mills. They called it Proximity to highlight their closeness to the cotton fields. And today, Cone Denim has the first piece of denim woven at Proximity Mills in our archives in North Carolina. Hello, Kingston students. Um, we're so honored to be here. Thank you, Bosin and the Transformers Ed for inviting us in. Uh, my name is Pierrette and I head up the design team for Cone Denim and uh, I'm based in New York. Today, we're gonna talk to you about cone significance in the denim history. Um, and we're gonna do a little mini, mini denim 101 on the basics we think you should know um, as you are beginning to work with this wonderful fabric. I'm Caitlin Holt, and I am over innovation and product development for the Cone team, and I am based in our corporate headquarters in Greensboro, North Carolina, where we were founded. Not we're going to go over some history, and then we'll get into the Denim 101. So Cone was founded in 1891. Um, this is the first denim swatch that we have from our proximity mill, which was located in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, the swatch is from 1896. It is a three by one right hand twill, um, and it is ring spun cotton, and it was woven on a Draper loom. Um, our historians uh, locally say that it was brushed and folded. Um, it was not finished, unsamperized, um, and it is plant based indigo from India. So it's very cool. And then the other fun fact we have is that. Uh, there wasn't a dye range like you'll see in the Denim 101. There was just one dye box and they would dye it and then roll it back up on a beam and then dye, like run it through again to get however many dips they want. So that's what creates that striation that you see in the fabric. And the other thing, just to kind of um, tack on to that in terms of weights, um, you'll notice this is 11 ounces. So um, typically in denim, um, in vintage denim in history, the earlier the years, the lighter the weight. Uh, the fabrics will be at 11 ounces because they went into workwear, um, workwear silhouettes. Um, the later the years, uh, so in the 70s and the 80s, you'll see the weights really bump up. So if you shop secondhand or if you shop vintage, um, Levi 501s during those eras, high percentage of your jeans are probably made from cone denim. Um, and then based on the years, so if you see the 70s and 80s, they're going to be like 13 and 14 ounce denims. So these are just some of our um, kind of milestones in, and also not only are they our milestones, they are denim milestones, right? Just kind of in the history of denim. As Caitlin mentioned, 1891, um, two brothers founded Cone Exporting Commission Company in New York City. Um, 1895, the Proximity Cotton Mills was started and that was where that swatch that we showed you was woven. Um, and it was called Proximity due to its um, proximity to the cotton field, gins, warehouses, and rail lines. Uh, just a few very significant milestones. 1921, the indigo rope dye range was created, and that really kind of set the tone on how um, denim has been has been dyed um, from a commercial standpoint from years after. So that's a big one. Um, 1932, the Samphorizer um, was was invented and Cone launched out, uh, their Samphorized denim in that year. So that um, 
that reduced that leg skewing, right? Uh, Caitlin showed you that swatch that was not finished. It was called what we term loom state. So if that gene um, was on, you would see a lot of leg twisting. So the samphorizer sort of corrected the leg twisting because it was seen as a defect. Um, so that's kind of big and most denim today is samphorized um, with the exception of the 501 or some really niche um, denim purist brands who do not finish their fabrics. A pinto wash denim, that's a pretty cool, um, you know, happy mistake in 69. There was um, a hurricane and a lot of flooding and um, due to the damage in the warehouse, the, the solution with... Uh, removed removed some dye from the fabric so it sort of had this kind of striation and I don't want to say tie-dyed effect but almost like a very cool natural stripe and we'll show you a photo of that um so S gene was the first of its kind and 2007 Cone patented and invented S gene which is a dual core technology so essentially for stretch denim what that did was it allowed the genes to retain their um their shape but it had more of a cotton hand um, because there, um, there is a need for polyester and elastane uh, for the stretch. So it was kind of a, a new technology and breakthrough in stretch denim. So in 2017, we um, built a cogeneration power plant, which is just a really efficient way to generate our own power um, with while being off of the main grid. So we can create power and create steam all in one little system. So it's very cool. And then further along our sustainability journey, um, we installed a zero liquid discharge facility um, also at our PARS facility in Mexico. So we are recycling over 90% of our water. Yeah, so we have a UFRO system. Um, so we ultra we use ultra filtration and we it goes through several membranes and the water becomes clean enough for you to drink after this system, which if you've seen denim processing um, or you'll see some pictures as we go through, you would not want to drink it before this system. Um, and then the reverse osmosis, what we don't use, the other 10% roughly uh, gets evaporated. So it's a very innovative system, especially in the denim industry where we use a lot of water. This is a big deal. Okay. And then we're going to get into some denim 101, just some basic denim knowledge on denim constructions and just how it's made. So this is just a map of where cotton is planted in the U.S., um, Specifically, we we use cotton from all over the world for different um, needs that we have or customer specific developments, things like that. Um, most of our cotton today is sourced from the orange and blue regions that you see on the map um, for denim or there's four ways to classify cotton, micronair, which is the fineness of the fiber, fiber length, fiber strength, and color. Um, and all of those play a really important role in denim because we we spin it into yarn, obviously, um, and those affect the fabric strength and the dye repeatability to get you a really consistent product when it comes out. So for sustainability in cotton, we have partnered with Oratane since January of 2021. Um, and and we were the first denim mill to use Oratane. Oratane is a basically the DNA of the cotton. They've mapped all of the cotton across the world, um, and they can take a finished garment off of a retail shelf and tell you what percent of that garment came from what region in the world. They can just get like a fingerprint of the cotton. So it's a really innovative technology um, and something we're really proud of as cotton harvesting and ethics come into play. This is something that allows us to have really transparent production um, and supply chain and give us a lot of control over traceability um, and things like that. Um, recycled cotton, that is something that is a huge part of what we do. Um, we've definitely, I would say, evolved in, I would, I don't know, Caitlin, I would say the last five years. And Cone has always worked with recycled cotton for a very, very long time in just um, the standpoint of taking you know, our dye waste and then putting it back into the yarn. So sort of like the mills, the mills waste and putting it back into yarn. But in terms of what brands have um, kind of gotten on board with was, you know, they've kind of put their stake in the ground. Um, every brand has a different sort of, um, you know, standard, whether it's 5% post-consumer recycled cotton or 20% overall recycled material, not just cotton. Um, we have really, you know, um, done a lot of R&D and, and Caitlin has worked um, with some great partners in the waste 
um, waste field to um, bring this to more of a commercial level. So just to kind of um, point that out, that recycled cotton is a very big, big part of what we do. And we do, we do see this continuing and ramping up in the future. Um, cone denim hemp. So just talking about fibers outside of cotton um, that we see as a significant fibers in what um, we do and the future, um, as well as really sustainable fibers. So hemp is something that Again, Kona has been working with hemp for probably, um, you know, in the last 20 years. In the last, I would say, eight years, we've um, worked with some different suppliers vetting the most sustainable sources. Um, we most recently launched a, an American hemp working with a farm in Alabama. Um, so that's been an exciting milestone. So hemp is great. It's a wonderful fiber to work with. Um, and we've really, um, I'd say we've kind of I feel perfected the way to do it in a commercial manner because hemp is a bast fiber. It's a scratchy fiber. So what do you need to do to that fiber to um, be, to make it a wearable gene? We combine it with other fibers such as cotton or refiber to really balance it out so that it not only looks beautiful, um, it's very comfortable and it can be worn by anyone. It's not limiting. Um, so it's wonderful for its sustainable properties. It's, you know, water reduction, just in terms of the growing, um, how easy it is to grow, um, the reduction in chemicals and pesticides. Um, and it has some, you know, you know, there are claims that it has antibacterial properties. It's a regenerative fiber and, um, there is a lot of transparency in that supply chain. So some of the fabrics that we sent you, um, do have, do you have uh, some of our best hemp fabric? So uh, we look forward to seeing what you do with them. Very excited. And as I mentioned, um, Refibra and Tencel, um, these, these have been very important fibers for us, sustainable cellulosic fibers. Um, as some of you may know, Tencel comes from, from wood pulp, from trees. Um, they're 100% biodegradable, but Refibra is sort of kind of like the evolution of it because it does use um, recycled, recycled cotton in addition to that wood pulp. So some of those hemp fabrics we do blend with Refibra. Um, we feel like it really is a complementary balance between the two. And again, it's um, just another great sustainable fiber alternate to cotton. Another one I just want to mention that we recently kind of uh, brought on board is Crayora. Um, we sell a lot of stretch denim. A lot of mills sell um, a good amount of stretch denim. So we are looking at ways of what are synthetic alternates. So we understand synthetics and their harm to the environment. Um, so we most recently launched a fiber called Crayor Regen to use um, as, a re as a replacement for the elastane component. So um, in the elastane component, this is made up of 100% recycled spandex. And it is GRS certified, um, and and it's you know there's a certificate published by the control union, so it's validated. Um, so that has been a really uh, nice alternative addition to our fiber menu. And then lastly is Ciclo. So um, how do we address an alternate to polyester? Um, you know we understand polyester plays a huge part in our you know growth and recovery and and those types of fabrics. So Ciclo its approach is it's an actually an additive technology. So it's an additive to the polyester. And what that does is um, the Ciclo polyester will degrade at similar rates as a um, cotton or a wool. So we can't say that it's completely biodegradable, but it, it, will, it will degrade at a quicker rate similar to a cotton or wool. Um, so we do utilize that fiber. It has become more important. Um, definitely see more visibility in the industry. But these are some other um, fibers that we we kind of um, blend in as alternates alternatives, and uh, we are continuing to look at others. But this is these have been really um, great breakthroughs at this stage. So you've probably heard a lot about ring spun and open end yarns. So this kind of dives into the difference. Um, you can see the image on the right has the ring spun versus open end from a structural standpoint. Um, so in a ring spun yarn, the fibers are aligned and then twisted. Um, and you can see based on the routing on the left, the ring spun yarns have three extra steps that the open end yarns do not have. Um, open end was invented in the 80s, I believe, and it runs at a much higher speed. Um, it has a better efficiency. 
because the yarns are not actually twisted, um, the fibers are kind of blown into a system and then there's wrapper fibers that wrap around the outside to hold it all together, um, which you can kind of tell in the image. It creates a completely different look when you're looking at denim. Um, it dyes differently. It has a different hand to it. Um, it has different physical properties. It's not as strong um, and it washes down differently. So it's just a different look. We tend to use them together a lot. We will blend, we'll con, uh, combine ring spun and open end um, just to get more balance and things like that. Um, open end is a less expensive version of a yarn. So, cause it runs faster and at higher efficiencies. So those are kind of the main differences um, in the yarn types that we use. So on both of our yarn types, you can <laughs> include a slub pattern. Um, so slub is a thick or a thin place in a yarn, um, and it is designed in a computer program. So you can see the picture of the yarn at the top. Um, the left side of that yarn is the standard yarn size. And then in the middle, you see a thick place. And on the right hand side, you see a thin place. So it, you can really tell it gets like it's a completely different yarn count basically, but it's just the slub. Um, and then you have like the slub program, which tells you how long or how thick and that the frequency of the slubs um, is all done in a computer program, which is the image on the top right. Um, we can include slub in warp and weft. Um, so the images below will show you the slub warp and then a smooth warp. And you can tell it still has some character. That's kind of what we love about denim is that that character pops through no matter what you do. Um, you can't get like super, super smooth. Um, and then you have your slub warp and fill, which is also known as crosshatch, if you've heard that. What's also very cool about this program is, you know, a lot, um, a lot of times we're, we get requests to replicate a vintage denim. So say it's something from like the 1950s um, or the 1920s this program and our very talented yarn engineer can replicate that pattern using this technology. So it's sort of this really cool um, science and art engineering combined together to replicate things from the past. So from there, we take yarn to warping. Um, we combined yarn into a rope in order to dye it. Um, in denim, you'll see that a lot of it is about doing something and then undoing it. So as we go through, I'll kind of try to point that out to you. But this is kind of the first step. We, we wound the yarn into a package, and now we're going to unwind each package and put it into a rope. After you have your ball warps, we go to dyeing. Um, so indigo is known for its ring dye effect. Indigo does not dye cotton. It just gets entrapped in the cotton fibers, which gives you that wash down wear in look that we all love about denim um, and indigo itself. So there's different factors that can influence the shade. Um, since it doesn't dye cotton, you have to control it in other ways. It's an art and a science. So it's the speed you run the range at, the number of dips, the number of boxes that you use, the pH of of the indigo itself, and then the yarn type and the TM, as I mentioned before with the ring spun versus open end. Uh, you can see in the image at the bottom how on the left-hand side, the yarn looks like a yellow-green color. Um, so when it comes out of the indigo bath, it is a yellow color and it oxidizes to turn blue. So it's a very cool process to watch. It's like my favorite part of the plant to just go watch the dye rain run. That's very beautiful. So we have several different dye types. Um, a pure indigo is just indigo. And then we can add a sulfur because the ring dye effect. So indigo doesn't go all the way to the core and a sulfur would. Um, so that creates a different wash down effect. You could put sulfur on the bottom or the top or both. Um, and then in order to get like a black fabric or a khaki or something like that, we can just dye sulfur on its own as well. We are also the first mill that ran US grown indigo um, for the first time in over a hundred years. In 2015, we ran that um, and we have been running it yearly ever since. So that is plant-based indigo. It's certified by the USDA, um, grown in the Tennessee region, Tennessee, Kentucky, places like that. Um, and we love that product. It gives it a really unique cast, which we'll see in a few minutes. Um, and then just the evolution of indigo, we're running distilled indigo, which is also, you may have heard of it as pre-reduced or liquid indigo. Um, and that is a reduction in the consumption of water chemicals and energy. So we're always trying to use less water. Denim is a water hog. 
again, so we're doing everything that we can to develop out of using more water. So we wanted to give an honorable mention to natural indigo, as Caitlin just talked about. Um, also kind of going back to our roots, if you look at that swatch from 1896 from proximity that was dyed with natural plant, plant indigo from India. Um, but we um, continue to you know, see this as important. We, like Caitlin mentioned, we've been doing it every year since 2015. Um, we honor it, it's beautiful, um, it's cast and, and what it you know brings to the table from like a design perspective, um, from a wash perspective is, is really unique and beautiful. So um, just, just a few points, you know, about natural indigo and definitely, uh, want to mention that it's still very important to, to what we do. So once the yarn is dyed in the ball warp form, it's then separated out again into beaming. Um, so each yarn is set into this like rake, um, to create a section beam. And then all the section beams go to slashing, uh, where we apply starch or size, depending on who you're talking to and what they call it. Um, all of our size material is biodegradable. So we're really just protecting the yarn. We coat it with this starch or size um, before it goes to weaving because weaving is a really aggressive process. So now we're in weaving. Um, and this image of the loom gives you kind of an idea of how it works. Um, we lift up some yarns and drop some other ones to create a shed. Um, and we can change the way that those move. And that gives you your uh, weave type. You can see the different options across the bottom. Um, as we you mentioned earlier, the original swatch from Proximity Mill is a three by one right hand twill. Um, a lot of the workwear that you'll see is usually a two by one right hand twill or left hand twill. Um, we run a lot of three by ones and then you'll see like a cowboy jean or a wrangler. They really love a broken twill. Um, that's like their signature move. So we run all of the weaves that you see below and then a couple more specialty ones as well. But so after weaving, we go to finishing. Um, gray is comes gray fabric is what comes off the loom, and then it goes through various different finishes um, depending on what look you want. Um, because it is typically a three by one right hand twill, the fabric is going to skew a little bit. So we add skew in the other direction so that when it washes, it all falls out, um, and you're left with like ideally a flat like a standard line of fabric. And if you're not skewing properly, you get the defect highlighted on the screen that you'll see. Uh, that's a twisted leg that comes from not properly skewing your fabric. So I have several jeans that are made that way um, and it is really annoying. So that's why we try to skew a lot of things. Um, and then our latest finish, um, which was a more sustainable investment um, that we made at all of our facilities is our ozone flash finish. So this is a uh, technology designed by Genologia. We're based in Spain. Um, so we have um, implemented these at um, our plants for a few reasons. So one is the um, the immense water savings. So you, on average, it's an 83% water savings, chemical savings, and energy. Um, so it's, it's also a zero discharge process without any water or chemicals. And then from a fabric standpoint, it actually improves your crocking and your color fastness. So a lot of brands really love that, um, especially fabric people. Um, there's something called an LSF score. So that is, um, more on the garment finishing side. And I believe, um, later in this program, you'll be, you'll be hearing more about finishing, but basically, what this does, it really preps the fabric. Once it goes through um, the garment lasering finish process, it really just kind of sets it up um, to have a really nice affinity for that laser. So you're gonna get some really nice contrast and things of that nature. Um, it also, it just cleans up the fabric. It looks, um, it cleans up the back, you know, the reeds up of any indigo on the back of the fabric. So that gives it a brighter appearance, a cleaner look to it. Um, and then, you know, again, it's in, in the laundry process, it, it potentially can reduce a lot of time um, and chemicals if you're if you're using laser. So we really love uh, this new finish. We're um, actually utilizing it to apply color in the next season. So we're, we're also evolving, you know, what it can do, but just kind of wanted to mention this as, as this is kind of like today's um, latest, most sustainable finish that we're doing on the fabric end of things. 
So after finishing, the fabric goes through inspection. Um, all of our fabric is inspected by a human. So we flag defects or cut out defects, um, which we hope we don't make. That's not what we try to do. And then from there, it gets rolled onto a specific roll size from a customer and it goes to the warehouse and then ships out. All right. So um, anyway, some questions, but thank you for having us. We are so excited to see what you, what you come up with um, on the fabrics and it's an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, can you, like, can, you, can you like hear us? Can you hear us okay? Yeah. Yeah, Hi. perfect. So we're just gonna we're just gonna show you what's going on. All the students that are here, that 200, 200 of them, they've wow. just seen your lovely video. It's good that we pre we actually pre-recorded it. It's quite clever. So um <laughs> that means you guys could just relax. There we go. They're all waving at you. So Hello. Guys, I'm gonna kick it off with a couple of couple of questions, and then you guys can think of some questions. So my first question is I really love black denim, but I want it to fade, so I want a white core. So I know with the sulfur, you can't do that. So it's still dyed the ring method, correct? Just so our students understand. Yes. So because we didn't so we didn't discuss that, but I know that it, is it popular or not so popular? Because I know people like it to be black, black when they make denim, right? You mean is ring dye effect a popular? Well, yeah, we don't we don't come yeah. across much black denim, which has got a white core. It's all sulfur backed. So it, it doesn't fade as it does, it fades differently, right? So it's not many articles yeah. that are black. I would say right now we're getting requests for both, right? Because there are some yeah. brands that are a little bit more contemporary who uh, want things to feel a little bit more tailored and clean. So they're going to want to go yeah. for that like black, black, but many brands want that ring dye effect. They want their black denim to look like, you know. Yeah, yeah like denim so from the seventies or something. Yeah. Exactly. So that, you know, the more ring dye effect on black, the more texture you get, the washes, you know, mm. are great. So I think we actually have a, a pretty big, um, big request for that type of denim that you just yeah, yeah I love, one other question is this is like Catalin uh, I love skewing <laughs> just, uh, <laughs> just putting it out there I like a good yeah. leg twist <laughs> so you know for me I like the I like raw unsamphorized shrink to hell love it that's me <laughs> anyway guys any questions for these guys the, the cone specialists are right here any questions like Neil any questions come on yeah. speak out loud come on guys they're tuning in from America come on we're really lucky. We're so honoured to have these people. You know, they're just they're just scared. You know, wait, we'll get a question. Oh, we're, we? we're also scared. <laughs> You're also scared. Yeah, see, they're we're also both scared. scared. <laughs> yeah. Any questions about yeah. Cohen? They're the Godfather denim mill man. Yes. So you know, half the things that we come across are invented by them. Yes, got a question? Please speak out loud. Okay. In terms of sustainability, what's next? For you guys, is it? It must be dyeing technology. It must be spinning technology. What's next? I can speak <laughs> from like a manufacturing yeah. side. Um, yeah. We are working to incorporate higher levels of recycled cotton. Um, so we are trying to use more sustainable fibers um, in a higher percentage to get that true circular story. Um, with wow. nothing goes to waste, which Perrette can talk to as yes. one of our collections. Nothing yeah. goes to waste was an amazing concept that you did, did a couple of years years ago. Absolutely. So lots of zero waste pattern cutting and using uh, less virgin ver, ver, virgin materials. That's what they're aiming for. And I guess chemical usage as well. You got that ozone flash finish. Yes. So you're looking at lots yep. of technology to reduce everything, right? And to be yes. a bit more, bit more, bit bit more, bit 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 more circular. That, that's the way it should be going. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think yeah. we have to look at it all, right? So you can go into dyes, you can go into finishing, um, you know, those those big investments like ZLD that, that you that you all saw earlier. Um, but, you know, when it comes to fibers, I think the, the thing that is top of mind is synthetics. Like what are the synthetic alternatives? So I feel like that's gonna be a continuation and evolution seeing what, um, you know, what fiber producers are going to kind of invent next in terms of synthetic alternatives. Um, so I would, I, I would hope to see in the next, you know, five to 10 years, a scalable, you know, scalable option that is going to be, you know, affordable for most brands. Cause you know, the issue that we come about, these things are really amazing. Um, but we can only do them on a certain scale. And also there's a price tag attached to it and it's not feasible. So, um, so I think from, from a fiber perspective, I think that's really fun, right? Caitlin, just kind of looking at alternatives of what, and also just how do you combine, um, different fibers to make something um, perform a certain yeah. way. 
like how we did with them. So it's a lot of you, experimentation, you know. It is. Like, sort of, sort of like you guys were one of the first to use hemp, from my understanding, for a very long time, and natural indigo. And also, you know, one of the first to use like sort of, sort of like sort of, one of the first to use a sort of like a sort of like circular. So, so well, not circular. The, so the one that that sort of additive that you use to the break C-Clo, down yeah. yes yes yeah. Uh, C-Clo. Yeah. so you know yeah. don't you know that so but thing is are these things are these things translated to the customer i guess some of them are some of them aren't it's like you some know are. it's like they're all yeah. named named like differently so it's more about yeah. education right for, for you guys to educate people yeah. yeah and then i think you know as far as like awareness in the industry it, it always takes one brand to make their story for everyone else to kind of you know, yeah. kind of tack on, not say follow, but I mean, I think they're just, it gives them confidence if somebody, you know, like a Levi's or, um, you know, a large denim brand goes out with something like that, they feel confident. Okay. If they did it, we can do it. And so then you start to see things sort of trickle, trickle down. Yeah. So, so well, well, you know, I remember also a good 12, 12 years ago, you guys were the first to use like sort of like, uh, recycled bottles for the first time. And that was a oh, huge yeah. thing. Yeah. You yeah. were the first and now everyone does it, but it's like, you know, you guys are innovators and we really appreciate you coming on and doing this recording and coming live with us. And, um, you know, any more questions, guys? We need to wrap up. Any, one more question. Anyone wants to ask a question? How many do you think are doing zero waste? <laughs> yeah. How many think on the zero waste? Oh, there we go. So there's a few of them going to do zero waste patterns. So it's going to be quite interesting to see what they do. Uh, but we're going to invite you guys to some of their fittings in the next few weeks if you're available yeah. and also we're going to invite you to the final as well yeah, maybe absolutely. you can fly here and oh, see hey. it. <laughs> but we're gonna we're gonna bribe broadcast it hopefully if you don't mess up and but, um but we'll invite you to a couple of fittings and you see what the students are doing it's a two week two month project we have just found it. Thank but you so much. We really appreciate time. your time. Thank you. We appreciate thank you being so here. So thank you for having us. Bye, guys. Thank you so much. Bye, 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 bye. bye.